In this video, we'll be giving a brief overview of some of the core concepts and definitions that we'll be using in this course. This lecture does not follow a chapter in your text directly. Rather, we'll be going over some of the background information that you will need before doing the readings and working on the assignments. To start with, we should talk about what's in the course title, Information Systems, or IS for short. So that sounds impressive, but what exactly are information systems? And what do they have to do with business? Well, our course textbook gives us the definition shown here. An information system is a group of components that interact to produce information. But this is a rather general definition and makes us ask a few questions. First question you might have is, do all information systems utilize technology in computers? After all, this is a computer science course. Well, it may be hard to believe now in the computer age, but computers and their use in business is a relatively new thing. Computers for general commercial purposes have only been around since the early 1950s and often took up whole rooms and cost millions of dollars. Shown here is the Universal Atomic Computer, or UNIVAC for short, the first commercially produced computer. It was as big as a room and adjusting for inflation would have cost about $7 million today, and that's not including the constant maintenance it needed. However, business have been around for thousands of years, far before computers were a reality. Before computers, information systems were largely paper-based, mainly consisting of filing cabinets, card catalogs, and ledger books. In fact, there are historical business records that are arguably evidence for information systems that even predate paper. Shown here is an ostracon, a limestone or clay writing surface used in the ancient world. This one in particular is from the period of Ramses II and 1250 BC. It is essentially a primitive spreadsheet that lists workers and dates in black and reasons for them being absent from work are listed in red. Regardless of the technology used, the primary purpose of these systems is to produce and manage information. In modern times, when talking about information systems, we are often talking specifically about computerized information systems. Computer information systems are comprised of four main components. Data. Computers, comprised of hardware, software, and supporting infrastructure. People. And procedures. It's through combining and leveraging these components that modern information systems are able to produce and manage information for some business purpose. In this course, we'll be specifically looking at computer information systems and their use in business. And we will be studying not just the practical applications like creating spreadsheets or databases, but more importantly, how we can use computers to make our business more efficient and effective. Now that we are starting to form an idea of what information systems are, and we will be going in much more depth on each one of these components later in the course, the next question is to address what is business and to find some common business terminology. So the textbook gives a definition of business as any endeavor or enterprise that achieves a goal um, through the effort of a person or persons that involve a monetary component. The key here is monetary component. Without money, we are just uh, doing a hobby or maybe starting a club. Once money is involved, it becomes a real business. This business could be selling a service, such as technical support, accounting services, or even something as simple as dog walking. Or it could be selling a physical product that is sold directly to consumers or another company. In either case, the important part is that money is involved. After hearing that definition, you might have some questions, such as, what about nonprofit businesses? They don't have profit, so how can they have a monetary component and be a business? Well, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's take a step back and define a few terms. For profit businesses are probably the kind we are most familiar with. These organizations primarily seek to generate revenue for itself and its shareholders. Clearly, there's a monetary goal here, as the core purpose is to make money. So what about nonprofits? Well, a common misconception is that nonprofit organizations don't make or generate money. 
This is not the case, and if you stop and think about it for a bit, you can see why. Nonprofits have employees to pay and expenses just like other businesses. They also generate money, sometimes even through direct sales to customers such as Goodwill, a nonprofit that sells used goods directly to consumers. So there clearly is a monetary component here. The key difference is that nonprofits' primarily primary purpose is not to make money, but rather some general public benefit. This means profits don't go to shareholders, but are instead invested back into the work the nonprofit is doing towards their objective. Finally, even a government can be considered a business under this definition. Governments collect taxes and generate revenue through the public corporations, and then turn it around and spend it on services for the same population it collects taxes from. This monetary component makes governments business in the same way nonprofits are. And when we look at all three, the same basic principles apply, regardless of the type or size of the business. And that principle is money. Businesses require money in order to operate. If you have costs and expenses, you're going to need a way to pay them or your business is not going to be sustainable. This means all businesses, regardless of its for-profit or not-for-profit status, or whether it is selling a service or a product, have the same single goal. And that goal is simply to have more money coming in than going out. The difference between money coming into a business and the money going out is known as margin. In a for-profit company, when we talk about margin, we would say that if the company has more money coming in than going out, it is making a profit. This profit could either be reinvested into the company or given to its shareholders. On the other hand, if the company has more money going out than coming in, we would say that it is operating at a loss, which could be a sign of trouble, or simply that the company is in a pre-revenue startup phase or is going through a period of growth where any profits are being invested back into the company. For nonprofits, we call a positive margin a surplus. This means that they have more money coming in than going out, that they must use towards their primary purpose and services they offer, rather than paying any dividends to shareholders, because they don't have any. This is the main difference between for profit and nonprofit businesses. Nonprofits don't have shareholders and they can't pay dividends. So the surplus has to go back into the company. If the nonprofit has a negative margin, we would call this a deficit. For government, if they have a positive margin, we would say they are under budget. This means that they have more money to pay for additional services or enhanced services to the public, or alternatively, they could reduce taxes. If they have a negative margin, we would say that the government is over budget and would need to increase revenue by either cutting services or increasing tax revenue. In the most general terms, we could say that a business is a success if it is operating on a positive margin. That is more money coming in than going out. Similarly, we could say that a business is a failure if it is operating at no or negative margin. That is more money going out. However, as with many things in business, this is not always so black and white. In some cases, Business may operate at a negative margin for a limited period while first starting up, going through periods of expansion, or due to periods of temporary reduced income. Netflix, for example, was founded in 1997, but did not have a profit until 2003, while it was growing its operations and subscriber base. Even through this period of loss, Netflix still attracted investors, as they could see the future potential in the company. A more recent example would be the airlines and travel companies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to lockdowns and a decline in travel, many airlines and travel companies were required to operate at a loss until lockdowns ended. This did not necessarily mean that the companies were a failure, simply that they were going through a temporary period of reduced income. So you may be saying, sure, I can see the problem with losing money, that is having a negative margin. But why does it matter if I have zero or low margin, so long as it is still positive? I am paying my bills and presumably my own salary, so why does it matter? Well, having a greater margin means having more money to use to grow your company. With additional funds, you can invest in the development of new products, more efficient equipment, or new employees. 
This growth is critical for businesses if they want to stay alive, as the company that stays stagnant for too long is going to start losing out to competitors and will quickly find itself in a negative margin or loss situation. Furthermore, your company may have investors or shareholders that have obligations to, including paying back loans or other debts, and having a high positive margin also helps attract future investors, which enables even more growth in the future. We now know what margin is and why it's important, but where does it come from? Margin comes from the operations of a business. When we look at a business, we can see that it's comprised of many different components or parts that must come together to make a whole that is greater than any individual component. So when we're looking at a business, we should ask, what does it take for it to operate? What are the components that make up the business? And perhaps most importantly, how does it actually work? Looking at a business, we now know about margin, and we can say that money is going in and money is going out, and the difference is margin. But what does the money coming in come from? How is this business generating revenue? And where is the money going out? What cost does this business have? What is the money being spent on? Every business starts with a core idea that someone thought up and built a business around with the hopes that it would be eventually profitable. When starting a business or are looking to invest in a business, the first question you should ask is, is this idea feasible? That is, will it make money? Will it eventually have a positive margin? But not only will it make money, will it make enough money to be worth your investment of time? Sure, it might be great if your business could break even, but if it's not going to eventually make enough to pay yourself a living wage, it's probably not worth your time as you could be pursuing other opportunities. One thing you'll be doing through the assignments in this course is creating an idea for your own business and assessing if it's feasible. But how do we tell if a business is feasible? Well, you're going to make an informed guess. The key word here being informed. Unfortunately, nothing in life or business is certain, and we rarely have the complete knowledge needed to know for certain if a business idea will be successful. This means that there will always be some element of risk, especially when first starting or expanding a business in a new direction. Take for example Netflix. Netflix was founded by Mark Rudolph and Reed Hastings in 1997, and in that time, that world was a very different place in terms of technology. The internet was starting to take off at home, but most people at best had dial-up connections, and most businesses were still wary of investing too heavily in a web presence. At the time, streaming video of any kind was very limited and unrealistic for most home users. Instead, Netflix got its start by allowing users to rent movies via their website, and they'd mail them the DVDs, which they could return after watching for a fixed fee per rental. Eventually, Netflix moved to a subscription model with a fee based on the number of DVDs the user could have out at a time, with no late or shipping fees. By the year 2000, Netflix was still operating at a negative margin and losing money. During this time, Mark and Reed offered to sell Netflix to Blockbuster, a brick-and-mortar movie rental store that some of you might be familiar with. And at the time, this was their main competitor. They offered $50 million. The CEO of Blockbuster was not impressed and claimed that the dot-com hysteria was completely overblown and declined the offer, struggling not to openly laugh them out of his office at the $50 million figure they were asking for. Unfortunately for Blockbuster, this decision did not age well. Netflix is now a multi-billion dollar company, and Blockbuster no longer exists, except for a single outlet, still operating in Oregon, which mostly sells Blockbuster branded merchandise to those purely buying it for novelty and nostalgia reasons, as well as to say they visited the last Blockbuster store in existence. The point is not that Blockbuster was necessarily foolish at the time for not buying Netflix. At the time, internet businesses like Netflix were new, not proven, and going through a dot-com bubble that was likely to burst. Rather, the point is that it can be hard to tell if a business idea is feasible even for an experienced CEO. All you can do is make an informed decision based on the best information you have at the time. So how do we make an informed decision about the feasibility of our own business idea? Well, the first thing we need to do is determine how much money we will need to bring in, 
in order to make a business viable. To determine that, we need to ask just how much money is going in and out. Or to put it another way, what are our costs and expenses going to be? How much money do we need to run this business? We can divide costs into a number of different categories. The first is direct material costs. These are costs of the raw materials or parts that go directly into producing your product. That can be tied directly to a single unit of the product. For example, if we are a toy manufacturer that creates plastic toy cars, the cost of the raw plastic that goes into each car would be a direct material cost, as we could say that each car we produced costs us a set amount of money, or a set amount of plastic. For example, maybe 10 cents of plastic per car. Similarly, clothing manufacturer would have direct material costs relating to things like cloth and thread used in each t-shirt. A manufacturer of electronic devices might have costs relating to the raw electronic components in their devices, such as the cost of capacitors and resistors in each device, and even the nuts and bolts holding the whole thing together. These costs can also include any packaging a single unit of the product comes in. Next are direct labor costs. These are costs that are tied directly to the wages and benefits of employees that are directly involved in manufacturing your product. Essentially, the amount you pay to employees that in some way touch or directly play in a role in assembling your product. Examples may include wages paid to assembly line workers, or even the cost your business pays for these workers' health insurance or other benefits. The next is manufacturing overhead. This includes any product manufacturing related costs that cannot be directly tied to an individual unit of product. For example, a company producing toy cars might know that they need glue and oil to make toy cars, but not exactly the amount that goes into each individual car. That cost of glue um, would be an overhead cost if they can't determine exactly how much is spent on each car. Similarly, Costs related to cleaning and maintaining the equipment used to create the toy cars would also be overhead costs. The costs of electricity used to make the product, or even the cost of electricity to keep the lights on and heating in the manufacturing plant, would also be overhead costs. Overhead also includes labor costs for employees not directly related to manufacturing um, your product such as security guards, supervisors, quality assurance employees, and maintenance personnel. Finally, the cost of transporting or shipping your product to where it needs to go, either directly to the consumer, to a warehouse, or to a retailer. These would be maintenance, or rather, manufacturing overhead costs. The exception being if you pass these costs onto the consumer, for example, if you made them pay shipping and handling. Finally, we have period costs. These are non manufacturing costs that are incurred each encounting period and not related to creating a product. This can include the cost of sales and marketing, including the cost to produce and place ads, wages paid to sales and marketing employees, and costs related to acquiring new customers. For example, going to conventions to demonstrate your product would be a sales cost that would fall under period costs. Any accounting or auditing fees, for example, if you have to hire an accountant. Office building costs, such as insurance, rent, electricity, or any uh, building not directly involved in manufacturing. Salaries paid to office workers, sales and marketing employees, and executives, including yourself. That's right, salary that you pay yourself is a cost for the company and not something that you simply take out of the margin. So you have to make sure that your salary is included as a cost, even when you're first starting up the business. It's important to pay yourself. But it's also important to keep track of that cost so you're not eating up the margin for your company. The cost of maintenance on office equipment, as well as depreciation, for example, on a photocopier, as well as the cost of office supplies, would also be period costs. Essentially, anything that's not tied directly to a unit of your product or indirectly to a unit of your product is going to fall under your period costs. This has only been a small number of examples. There are also costs relating to things like product support and returns, who's going to help customers when something goes wrong with the product, 
or it needs to be returned. When you start a business, there's also a significant startup cost when buying your equipment for the first time, or even creating your business website and your technological infrastructure. Also costs relating to um, recruiting new employees and many, many other things. All of these costs have to be considered before starting your business, and you need to determine if the idea is viable. How many units of your product are you gonna to have to sell to break even with these costs? How many will you have to sell not only to break even, but to have a reasonably high margin? If you're confident that you can make enough sales to cover the costs and still have a reasonable margin, we would say that the business idea is feasible. So at this point, we have a business idea and we have done some work towards determining costs. And I have an idea of the margin it will be operating at. We have concluded that it should be a viable idea and a feasible business. The next step is to start asking the question, how do we run this business? Well, there is a critically important commodity that any business needs in order to run effectively and efficiently. What do you think that commodity might be? What is the most important commodity for any business? Is it profit? Is it margin? Is it money in the bank? Maybe your product and intellectual property. Is it your employees? How about your IT infrastructure? I'm gonna give you a second to think about it a bit. Is it something that I've listed here? Or is it something else? What do you think the single most important commodity for running a business is? And we're back. So what did you think the most important commodity is? Well, when we're talking about running a business and making business decisions, it's not any of these. Instead, the most important commodity for any business is information. Information is extremely important. Running a business is making decisions. For a business to be successful, it needs to make more correct decisions that benefit the business in the long term than incorrect or short side decisions that hurt the business. And what are we going to need to make decisions? Um, we're gonna need information that is correct and timely. Having up-to-date, accurate, and complete information means making good business decisions, which in turn means a successful business. So how do we run a successful business? Well, it's simple, we track everything. For example, earlier we discussed identifying different kinds of costs associated with your business. But simply identifying these costs is not enough. We need to be constantly tracking all money going in and out of the business. While the idea of tracking everything is simple, it does raise some important questions. What to track? What exactly is everything for your business? What data is important? And once you figure that out, how are you going to track it? And finally, why? Why are we tracking this data? How does tracking this data help us make good business decisions? We spoke of information being the most important commodity. Is this data we are tracking actually information? Well, no. Data, information, and knowledge are closely related and interconnected concepts, but they are not equivalent. Data is raw facts, figures, and numbers without context. For example, here are two recorded temperatures, five degrees Celsius and negative 10 degrees Celsius, without any context. This would be an example of data. When we add context to the data, 
we get information. For example, if we add to the context that these are temperatures, are the high and low for today's forecast, this data becomes information and is far more valuable and useful as we have added both relevance, this is a forecast, and a time frame, it's today's forecast. That means this is also timely information. Without context, data is just meaningless numbers and figures. Applying what we already know from past experience allows us to derive knowledge from information. For example, applying this information with past experience to conclude that we should wear a jacket today would be knowledge. This is also an application of information. Here we have a few examples of data, information, and knowledge, but they are not labeled as such. I would like you to take a few seconds to look over each item, and based on the definitions we just discussed, determined if each item is data, information, or knowledge. So let's take a look. Item three is just a list of numbers. And similarly, item five is just a list of animals. Both are provided without any context. This means these items are data. Item two gives context to the list of animals. Apparently, this is a list of animals considered to be household pets in London. Similarly, item four provides context for the numbers. They are the heights of the students in centimeters. This combination of data with a meaningful context makes it information. Item one applies the information we know about student heights to produce knowledge. The tallest student in the class is 175.3 centimeters. Item six applies our list of household pets to classify a new animal that we don't know about yet. This application is again, knowledge. So we now know the reason we track data is to produce information to aid in business decisions. But how do we track it? Well, we already discussed that in the past, we track this kind of data via paper-based information systems, such as filing cabinets, card catalogs, ledger books, and teams of people managing them by following procedures. In the modern computer age, 
we now use databases to track, collect, and produce massive amounts of data into usable information. Spreadsheets to handle smaller accounting and data analysis tasks, and IT systems to utilize that information through applications such as customer relationship management software or supply chain management software, which we will talk about later in the course. So to summarize, what do we track? The easy answer is everything. The hard answer is everything for our particular business. But what is that? At the very least, it should be the money going in and out, so we always have an idea of our margin. Why do we track it? To obtain or create information to aid with business decisions. How do we track it? With databases, spreadsheets, and other IT systems, which we'll be going into more depth in this course in later weeks. Now, this may seem rather straightforward and simplistic in theory, but in practice, it can be quite complex. It's not a one-off system you build at the start of your business and you're done, but rather a continuous and ongoing process of building, testing, and adapting your information system to your current business needs and constantly improving it to track new things as they come up and the technology changes. So we've covered quite a few new definitions and concepts in this video. So let's have a quick summary of terms. Information systems are groups of components that interact to produce information. They can be physical systems, like recording information on paper, or they can be computerized. Computer information systems are those information systems that specifically use computers to produce information. They are comprised of computers, both software and hardware, data, people, and procedures, and their output is information. Business is any endeavor or enterprise that achieves a goal through the effort of a person or persons that involves a monetary component. The key here being the monetary component. We also covered the three main types of business, for profit, non-profit, and government. The main difference between um, these were whether they have shareholders and what they do with their profits. Another important topic was margin. Margin is the difference between the money coming in and the money going out. When we run a business, we want to be constantly aware of our margin and ideally always operating at a positive margin. We discussed feasibility and how we can tell if a business idea has potential. The key here being if we think it will have a positive margin that is large enough for the business to be viable in the long term. We talked about identifying costs and the different types of costs. Direct material costs are the costs of the raw materials that can be tracked to a single unit of production. Direct labor costs are wages and benefits we pay to employees directly involved in the manufacturing of a unit of product. Manufacturing overhead is all other product related costs that can only be indirectly linked to product we manufacture. Period costs are non-manufacturing costs that are expensed within an accounting period and not related to creating a product, such as office supplies or executive salaries. Finally, we talked about data, information, and knowledge, and the differences between them. Data being raw facts and figures, information being data in a meaningful context, and knowledge, the application of information, or drawing on past experiences. So before we go, there is one exit ticket activity we should try. After you finish this video, I want you to start thinking about and coming up with an idea for your own home business. This should be a business that creates some kind of physical product that you can make yourself and sell from your home. For now, we will assume that you are the only employee and that it, this is a for-profit business. Come up with a name for this business that's not already in use by a real business. The best way to check would be to simply check Google and come up with at least one physical product your business makes. You should also make a list of all the costs your business might have. Consider things like raw materials going into your product, costs like rent and equipment, sales and marketing, packaging and shipping, and of course, a salary that you'll pay yourself. Once you have a good list, start dividing each cost into different types, into direct material costs, direct labor costs, manufacturing head, and period costs. 
Finally, I want you to decide if this idea is feasible. How much will you have to sell or how many units of your product will you have to sell to break even? How many sales will you have to make each month to have a positive margin? So you don't have to record or submit your answer to me yet. However, this question will play a big part in our first assignment that will be posted in week two. So I highly recommend getting a head start by starting to think about this problem and coming up with a business and some costs now. It'll make assignment one go much smoother if you start working ahead. So that's all I have for you in this video. Make sure to check out chapter one lecture that should be up right after this one and start thinking about that home business idea. Thank you for watching and have a great day.